Welcome back. This is part two of my discussion of black holes, in which I dig into some of the evidence that black holes are science fact and not science fiction. Black holes were originally proposed in the 1920s by a famous gravitational physicist by the name of Carl Schwarzschild. But for a long time, you could reasonably ask, are black holes real physical things out in space, or are they simply weird predictions of the mathematics of general relativity that don't in fact exist? And it's a hard question to answer because black holes, by definition, can't give off any light, so we can't see them directly in our telescope. But we can see other matter near the black hole. So we can look for light coming from other stars near black holes, or from gas near black holes, or from other phenomena in which the black hole's gravity plays a role. Some of the earliest evidence that black holes comes from looking at a black hole with another star in orbit around it. And we call these things X-ray binaries. An X-ray binary is basically just an X-ray source that happens when some mass from a star gets pulled off of that star by the gravity of a nearby object. And that nearby object could be a black hole or a neutron star. And as that gas falls towards that small, strongly gravitating object, that gas is going to heat up and it's going to start glowing with black body radiation. So we can look for the light coming off of that glowing disk of rotating gas that you see pictured on the bottom right corner of the slide. There's a limit for how much light can come off of a rotating gas disk like that. The limit gets higher and higher and higher as the mass of the thing in the middle gets higher. So stronger gravity is able to contain the disk better and prevent it from blowing itself apart under the influence of its own luminosity. So if we go out and we find an object, like the one pictured on the slide, which is giving off so much light that it, the central object in the middle of that disk has to be more than, say, three to five times the mass of the sun, that's pretty good evidence that the thing in the middle that's doing the gravity and holding that disk in place, that thing would be a black hole. Some of the first X-ray sources ever identified were good candidates for being powered by black holes. And in fact, the very first X-ray source ever discovered in the sky, called Cygnus X1, is an example of this type of behavior. Um, on the upper left corner of the slide, you can see the constellation Cygnus, which is a swan, and then along the neck of the swan, uh, pointing down towards the bottom of the slide, you'll see a little circle that marks the location of Cygnus X1. But it's pretty easy to wriggle out of evidence like that because there's a lot of hemming and hawing and a bunch of intermediate steps that you have to make in order to infer the existence of black holes. For a long time, those X-ray binaries were our best evidence, but since the mid-1990s, our evidence has been getting progressively stronger. The next good piece of evidence that we've accumulated was by looking at the orbits of stars near the center of the Milky Way galaxy. As telescope technology improved, both our ability to take images in the infrared, which can peer through all of the dust between us and the center of the galaxy, as well as our ability to take very high resolution images, we developed the ability to map out the orbits of stars near the center of the Milky Way, and we found them looking like what you see pictured on the right-hand side of the slide. Here, you can see some stars in orbit around the central black hole. That empty white star in the middle shows the location where the mass is concentrated by looking at the stellar orbits and as you can see, there's no light coming from that middle location. Let's watch this again, this time at half speed. As you look, any star that gets close to that central star 
rapidly reverses direction. That yellow star that we saw just a moment ago passed very, very close to that central black hole and then changed direction. The same thing is about to happen once again as that yellow star returns to that central black hole. The only way of explaining this is if there's a tremendous amount of mass in the middle responsible for all these stellar orbits. If we look at all of those stellar orbits taken together, we figure out that in order to explain all of them, there needs to be a mass in the middle about four-ish time, or four-ish million times, million's important, four-ish million times the mass of the sun, and that big collection of mass can't be giving off any light. That sounds an awful lot like a black hole. So this is much better evidence than the X-ray binaries because it requires fewer intermediate steps. But it's still possible just to wriggle out of this. It's pretty implausible, but you could argue, well, if you take a region about the size of our solar system, and you pack in around 4 million masses worth of neutron stars, and you turn them really, really cold, that would solve this problem. They would not give off any light because they're cold. A volume the size of the solar system is big enough that those neutron stars would not just spontaneously turn into a black hole on their own, and it's small enough that it's consistent with the observed stellar orbits. So it's really contrived, but if you want to play devil's advocate, it was still possible to do that. That stopped being possible in 2015. In the year 2015, astronomers first observed gravitational waves from a pair of merging black holes. First, let me pause briefly and talk about what is a gravitational wave. A gravitational wave is a distortion in the fabric of space and time. Here we see two black holes in orbit around one another with a background of stars that we can see move as the distortion of space caused by those black holes changes. Because the two black holes are moving, they're bending light that passes them slightly differently. And it's apparent not only near the middle of this star field, but also near the edges. Let's watch that again. If you look at the stars near the edges of the field, say the upper right or the lower left, you'll see even those distant stars moving around a little bit because the distortions in the fabric of space and time move outwards from those two orbiting black holes out off into the universe. As they move out, they carry away a bunch of energy, and as they carry away energy, the orbits of these two black holes decay, and they move towards one another. Let's watch this one more time. As we see these two black holes orbiting, moving towards one another, and all those gravitational waves are going out into space, somewhere, way off in the distance, humans are listening to the sound that these two black holes are creating as they move towards one another and prepare to merge. And that sound will sound something like this. Whoop! So right as those two black holes merge, we can see them coalesce on the screen, and we also hear that characteristic chirp sound, which is unique to black holes. That's a gravitational wave. Now, anytime we have two black holes or stars or a planet and a star, anytime we have two masses in orbit around one another, they're creating these gravitational waves those gravitational waves carry away energy, and eventually those two objects should merge. We saw that for the first time in 2015. And when those two black holes combined, they created this really distinctive signal that I showed you in that video. A sound like that. So we heard space ring as two black holes combined, and there's no other way we know of to explain those data. So the jury is in, black holes are real. And then for a little cherry on top of the cake, 
just last year, in 2019, we managed to actually image a black hole for the first time. A group of astronomers working on something called the Event Horizon Telescope, which is actually an Earth-spanning network of radio telescopes, all networked to work together, observing the same target. Well, all those telescopes managed to put together an image of a black hole in a nearby galaxy. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see a simulation of what light coming from the region of space near a black hole should look like. On the left-hand side of that image, you'll see a bright part of the ring, and on the right-hand side, you see a sort of dimmed part of the ring caused by the rotation of the black hole. And then, if you look in the true image, on the right-hand side of the slide, we see that same basic structure. It's a little bit less smooth than the image on the left because these are real data and so real data are imperfect, but it has that right basic structure where one side is brighter than the other side due to a phenomenon that we call Doppler boosting. So we have really strong evidence that black holes are real and we can even go and take a picture of them. So do black holes really exist? Yes, they do. We have really great evidence for that. And we have multiple chains of evidence that all point in the same direction. We can look for the gravitational influence of the black hole on nearby matter by looking either at X-ray binaries or at stars in orbit around a black hole, or we can even look for the gravitational influence of a pair of black holes on the very fabric of the universe. And all three of those lines of evidence point towards black holes really being out there. And then, as if that wasn't enough, we did finally, at long last, manage to take a picture of one in the relatively recent past. Okay. Thank you for your attention. I'll see you next time.